I give to you now my testimony of the drawing and wooing power of God's love. Since I was a small child, I felt the drawing of God. Through the testimony and teaching of my parents and many other godly people that I knew, I saw God's love through them. I learned of God's love through others, through the teaching of his word. And even as a small child, it drew me. It was that perfect divine love that wooed me. It was only the beginning, though, of my realization of how much God loved me. I quickly learned reverence for God and for Christ, and I took God very seriously. Even as a child, he was very real to me. He wasn't just someone we talked about at church. He wasn't just someone that we obeyed. He was someone who loved. He was a person who loved. And I wanted to please him, and I wanted everyone around me to please him too. And I wanted to please him because he loved me. You know the feeling you get when someone dishonors or makes fun of someone you love? You know that feeling? Remember when you were a child and maybe someone would just make fun of your parents just to get at you? How it made you feel? Well, that's how it made me feel when someone would take God's name in vain or would speak disrespectfully of things that were sacred, even when I was very young. And the, w the reason why is because even then, God was drawing me by his love. Amen. I learned that reverence and love for God from God himself. He loved me, and his love constrained me to love him back. Years before I was baptized, I felt God wooing me, drawing me by his love. Knowing that God loved me compelled me to think about him a lot. Many times when I had a question about God, I would first go to one of my thinking spots. I had a lot of thinking spots. And uh, I'd go to the rocking chair, the swing, or sometimes lie on the floor and just think about God. I vividly remember one time when I just laid down on the floor. I guess mother was napping. I laid down on the floor and, uh, and I was thinking about how God had no beginning and he had no end. Now, I was about six or seven when I was doing this. I remember, I remember very vividly doing this. And, and it about took me forever before I quit thinking about it. And, uh, I, but I always knew, too, that if somehow, after thinking, I, it didn't make sense. I know I could do, go to mom or dad or some other believer that I knew. And they could always make sense out of my questions. But I thought about God a lot. I wanted to know him. I wanted to understand God because I loved him. And my parents, thankfully, gave me many opportunities to think about God, who he was, what he did, what he did, why he does what he does, why what he does is always good, why what he does is always in love. One of the ways uh, my, my parents encouraged me to think was uh, father had a radio program that he encouraged me to go on with him. I believe I was about eight when I did most of that, but uh, he would always write down questions for me to look over. Uh, he never discussed the questions with me, so he never knew what I was going to say. He just trusted me to look at those and think about them, and then when the time came, he'd say one of those questions, and whatever came out, came out. And there was one time, I know that Dad can tell a story better than I can, but... One Saturday, I guess the topic came upon God's protection, something along those lines. And one of the questions that Father had written down for me was, would God ever allow the devil to hurt his children? Now, I told you that I thought a lot. I would think very hard. And now I know that context is king, but at the time when Dad was presenting his lesson, I was just thinking about my answer I was going to give. I was not listening to the context of what he was saying. 
and after all, I was about eight, so Dad finally asked the question, would God allow the devil to hurt any of his children? And I said, well, of course. Don't you remember Job? That, that was not the appropriate answer for the context, but I had been thinking hard about it. Sometimes maybe a little too hard. But I can see now through that. See, I can see now. I can look back on that and see how God was calling me. He was wooing me. He was drawing me even then, even in my thought processes, even in my heart, he was drawing me. And yes, I reverenced God, and I did think hard about him, even then. And what would compel a small child to do something like that? Well, it wasn't because I was exceptional in and of myself. It wasn't because I was a brain child. It was because I knew God's love. It's because God's love brings us much higher than we could ever be in and of ourselves and without him. He causes us to think deeper about things than when we would ever think, to understand things we would never understand, to feel ways we would never feel if it was not for his love. And he wooed me. His love for me gave me a love for him, and I respected him, and I wanted to know him. I always talked a lot about God. I always did. And when an opportunity didn't present itself, I made one. <laughs> Sometimes that opportunity presented itself at the lunch table at school. In which case, I would just throw out the question, so, what do you think about God? Now, if you don't think elementary students can't have a theological discussion, you should have sat at my lunch table. Kids can be very perceptive. Kids can also be very hard. And I thank God that he gave me a soft heart. That even then, I was able to be drawn by him and feel his love and know his love and return his love. Amen. I was confounded by the fact that people could react so ne negatively to God. A God that loved them so much. It is sad, it's a sad commentary on humanity to consider that so many have rejected the only one who is fully righteous, who is holy, and whose name is love. It was the case when I was a child, it's the same today and it's always been, that the flesh cannot see the liberty in loving God, only the restraints. And while love forgives sin, it does not excuse sin. So people choose a counterfeit of that love that offers their desired license. If we reject love himself, how dreadful to think what we have accepted in his place. I thank Christ for the grace to choose life and respond in faith to the wooing of God's love. Amen. As a child, I received that grace and was very serious about God then just as I am now, even more so now. I loved him and I wanted others to love him. People then, just like they do now, asked, well, how can you know God exists? Even if he did, how could you know him? But see, those questions never meant much to me because I loved him. I love him. There's no question, does he exist? Can you know him? I love him. And that's enough. I was strongly drawn to God again because I knew he loved me. And it was the only the beginning of my love and my understanding of how much he loved me. Up into my teens, after my family moved to Joplin, I continued to grow in my faith and remained very serious about God. I didn't care for youth groups. Never did, never have, don't really now. Didn't care for silly songs in church. Didn't fit in with my peers because of that either. 
I uh, just never got anything out of that because I was serious and I knew God was serious and I knew that that if we really were serious about him and really loved him we would approach him in a way that would please him I experienced a lot of frustration at Christian camps I attended because it was the exception when anyone compelled me to really think about anything still I went Still I went because there were opportunities that presented themselves every year. I was given an opportunity, everyone was given an opportunity to give a, a devotion, campfire devotion, and I, I always was able to take that. I was like clockwork. Everybody knew, oh, he's going to have a devotion that week. I know that many people thought I was strange, but as I told someone once, I'd rather be weird than dead. I don't think they thought I was any more normal after that comment. But <laughs> I don't think uh, that matters, though. I have often been told by my peers that I'm eccentric. Often. Very often. Sometimes I just think they're dull and boring, but they think I'm eccentric. But I never want my love to grow dull. I never want to fade in the background when it comes to speaking up for Christ. So I choose to be eccentric, and I know you do too. See, even through my frustrations, and I know that in your frustrations too, God continued to teach me to love. Love is patient, you know. Love is kind. And during those years of adolescence, God focused on teaching me how to speak the truth in love. That if I really loved him, I would draw people to him like he wooed me to himself. And yes, it was possible to be passionate and compassionate at the same time. The Lord still has to remind me of that often. I am best reminded by considering the love of my Savior who gave up his life for me. Amen. It is a very humbling thing to consider Christ's love. Amen. But it is also empowering. So much I've seen and experienced up until this day, I could not have dealt with wisely or recovered from except for God's love, his compassion, his grace, and his strength. I gave my life to Christ when I was nine years old, before our move to Joplin, before my brother was diagnosed with a brain tumor, before my sister Leah died of ALS, before I met my husband and before we were married and began our ministry together, See, I was only beginning to know how much God loved me, how great his love was, not just for me, but for people. And not just for people, but ultimately for Christ himself. And in more joys and trials than I can share with you, God's love has been faithful to me and still is now. Through the joys and heartaches of ministry, God's love has been faithful, faithful to teach, to reprove, to guide and empower me. I have grown in my love for him, and his love still woos me closer to him. Amen. In the last five years, God has called me to proclaim his word. He has given me the strength to originate several women's retreats, Bible studies, spiritual retreats for young women. The Lord has opened many doors for me to speak at at conventions, camps, and retreats. God has blessed me with many dear Christian friends and given me outlets to be of service to him. And I do not say any of that to get any applause from any of you. That is not why I say it. I say it because if it were not for the love of God, I would not be able to have done any of that. Period. I could have not done it at all not even acted like it was a good thing. I could not have done it if it were not for Christ. If God did not love me and had not sought me or did not have a purpose for me, I could not have done anything for him. Amen. If God did not love me, I couldn't have done anything for him. What a blessing God gives us the means of expression for the love he gives us for himself. Amen. See, I take joy in that. I take joy in the things he gives me to do. Not because they are mine. Not because they draw attention to me. 
Not because other people think it's a good thing, but because it's my way, one of the ways I can say to God, I love you too. Amen. I accept you too. Amen. I love the Christ that you love. And because I do, I will share him. I will work for you. I will be joined to other believers. And I will do what I can to edify them. I take joy for what I do for God because I do it out of love and respect for him. And I do it all for him. I'm serious about God. And I want to share him with everyone whether or not they know him. His love has made me what I am and is changing me into what I will become. And he's doing the same thing to you if you love him too. I've come so far and grown so much because my Heavenly Father loves me. And still I have much more ground to cover. My childhood, during my childhood, Christ wooed me to himself. But I do not claim to have always been a Christian. I will not claim that. I needed to be redeemed just as badly as any of you. Because without God saving me and cleansing me of sin, I would go to hell just the same, even if I was whitewashed. His love and grace saved me. I was in distress and without hope, and in his love and in his pity, he redeemed me. His love still draws me. In his love, he lifted me up and carried me, and his love still draws me. I was once in rebellion to God, but in his love, God taught me obedience, and his love still draws me. When I was a smoking flax, he did not quench me. When I was a bruised reed, he did not break me, because in his love, he wanted to draw me. I once was ignorant and without understanding, but in his love, God opened my eyes, and he, by his love, still draws me. I was full of pride and sin, but his love covered all the offenses I did against him, and his love still draws me. There were times I could have despaired of life if God's love did not give me purpose and strength, and his love still draws me. I had a burden heavy, too heavy to carry, though I once thought I could. But I exchanged it for a cross to carry. And by his love, he draws me. I love God because God first loved me. And I remain a believer today because his love is faithful. I know God's love is a much deeper and, in a much deeper and profound way than I did when I was a child. I understand more. I've learned more. I love more. And I have not forsaken my first love. And I no longer call him Balai, but Ishai, as the prophet Hosea said. No longer master, though he is, but husband, because he wooed me. I was once like the woman that Hosea married, a woman loved by her husband and yet is an adulteress. But he led me with cords of love, and his love still draws me. Amen. Today I am not stumped when people ask me if I know there's a God, and I still have no doubt if one can know him. But that is because I love him. I love him because he first loved me. It was because God reached out to me in love that I was able to respond in love to him. It was that perfect divine love that wooed me and continues to draw me. And even now, I've just begun to know how great his love is. Amen.